Well, thank you all for being with us. Thanks to the members of the National Space Council. And uh, why don't you join me in thanking the President one more time for his uh, leadership and hospitality. Today. We're, uh, we're honored to be at the White House today and uh, the presence of the third meeting of the National Space Council uh, here at the White House, surrounded by members of our council as well as by members of our user advisory group and other industry leaders and our distinguished panelists, uh, I trust is a reflection of the priority that you just heard in the President's words, uh, that the President uh, and our entire administration are, are placing on American leadership uh, in space. Uh, I do want to say thank you again to all of the distinguished guests who are here, uh, to uh, members of uh, the user advisory group, uh, but also to distinguished members of Congress who have already been introduced. We are grateful for your leadership uh, and, uh, and grateful for your presence, but not, not surprised uh, by your presence today. And so uh, join me in thanking these members of Congress who have already been introduced. We appreciate that. Uh, we have a great lineup of uh, panelists today, uh, three panels uh, that will all be uh, working uh, under, uh, uh, under the umbrella of our conversation about the moon, Mars, and worlds beyond. Uh, and the focus today will be on how we continue to move forward uh, to uh, permit greater uh, private development of space, as you just heard the President reflect on, uh, but also uh, how we revive and continue to expand human exploration in space with American leadership and American platforms. Um, uh, we're going to begin uh, with uh, reports uh, from uh, members of uh, the uh, National Space Council and to all the cabinet members who are with us today. I want to thank you for the efforts that you've made and all the agencies that are represented here. It represents the very, very best of the kind of teamwork that the President uh, relies on in this administration, and we're grateful for it. Uh, with that, uh, to kick things off, um, uh, Secretary Ross, uh, if you could provide us with an update on the work of the Commerce Department implementing the uh, President's uh, Space Policy Directive 2. We'll begin there. Mr. Vice President and members of the National Space Council, it's an honor to be with you again today and to have joined President Trump as he signed Space Policy Directive 3. Since we last met in February, Commerce has been working hard to meet industry needs, conducting regulatory reforms critical to commercial space growth and making America the flag of choice for space commerce. My staff and I have met with dozens of space-related companies, from the large to the small launch providers, to the satellite, data collection, and Earth observation companies, and the innovators who plan to bring mining and manufacturing into space. We always hear the same thing. America is leading in space once again under the leadership of President Trump. There's a booming economy, an actively engaged and supportive president, and a cabinet committed to cutting red tape. Space Policy Directive 2, signed by President Trump last month, directed the Department of Commerce and other agencies to execute regulatory reforms that will advance business opportunities in space. Commerce has much to report. On May 24th, the same day President Trump signed SPD 2, we announced our plans for a new Space Policy Advancing Commercial Enterprise, or Space Administration, under my direct supervision. Commerce's existing Office of Space Commerce and the Commercial Remote Sensing Regulatory Affairs Office, both now buried deep within NOAA, are being consolidated. Our establishment of the Space Administration will not create more government bureaucracy, just the opposite. The Space Administration will consolidate and streamline activities previously spread throughout the department and the executive branch. Our space commerce reforms are led by the department's regulatory reform officer, 
a position created by President Trump's Executive Order 13771 to direct deregulation efforts. The New Space Administration will be a one-stop shop within the department for promoting, administering, and regulating commercial space activities, including remote sensing, export controls, GPS, spectrum policy, business and trade promotion, and standards and technology, and now space traffic management as well. This week, ahead of schedule, the department will also submit to the White House Office of Management and Budget a legislative proposal to solidify our industry-focused space administration. I'm also excited to announce our new director of the Office of Space Commerce, a presidentially appointed position that's been left vacant for about a decade. Under the leadership of Kevin O'Connell, the Office of Space Commerce will once again be the government advocate of the U.S. space policy. We look forward to having Kevin on board soon. He's spent 35 years in government and private sector leadership roles, working in national security, intelligence, and commerce. He is the perfect man for the job. Space commerce is getting dedicated attention at the department once again. In line with the president's directive, commerce is also reforming the 25-year-old commercial remote sensing regulatory environment. Regulations must keep up with advancing industry, not slowing it down. Last week, as promised, the department submitted to OMB our advanced notice of proposed rulemaking on remote sensing. It will be posted in the Federal Register this week. This proposal seeks industry feedback on streamlining and simplifying the commercial remote sensing approval process. New regulations are needed to accommodate changing technologies and business activities. After the 60-day comment period, Commerce will issue a new proposed rule this fall. We've already made significant improvements. Commerce has signed an agreement with the Departments of Defense, State, Interior, and the Director of National Intelligence to reduce wait times on satellite remote sensing applications. The agreement sets more definitive decision timelines for licenses, elevates decision-making to senior government officials if the deadlines are not met. Before its implementation, the average time to receive a NOAA license was 210 days. Now the average time to grant licenses has been reduced by more than 50% to an average of 91 days. Over the last couple of months, we've shown that government can and must work together to adapt and enable new business activity. Earlier this year, SpaceX, like many other launch companies, was not previously aware that the second stage camera recording and live video feed of its Falcon 9 launch were regulated under the National and Commercial Space Programs Act. The law requires authorization of camera activity from objects in Earth orbit to protect national security interests. On May 3rd, we approved a blanket remote license for SpaceX's future rocket launches. The license grants SpaceX permission to image while in the second stage of their launches. A first of its kind, this license is valid for all launches with certain specified cameras and is valid through January 1st, 2019. The license was processed through an expedited review with interagency partners in only 23 days. This license permits SpaceX 
to publicly live stream imagery from space, providing certain parameters are met, including time and position. The department will pursue such blanket license opportunities for all similar companies to alleviate the need for repeated onerous applications. This is a great example how government can work quickly when it wants to. Next week, we will begin interagency discussions to implement space export control reform. And our National Telecommunications and Information Administration is coordinating with the FCC to conduct spectrum management analyses essential to the future success of space businesses. And finally, as announced this morning in SPD 3, we will begin to take on a role as the civil agency interface for space traffic management and space situational awareness. I commend President Trump, Vice President Pence, and the Space Council for finalizing the first comprehensive policy on space traffic management. It is really needed. Over 600,000 bits of space debris fly around the Earth at tens of thousands of miles per hour. Amidst the torrent of space debris, there are over 800 operational American satellites, critical to U.S. national security, Earth observations, weather forecasting, public safety, and GPS. Their solar panels are especially vulnerable to space debris. And there are thousands more satellites on the way soon. These devices are the magnificent result of billions of dollars of public and private investment and efforts must be taken to protect them. We will work closely with DOD and other departments to meet the challenge of increased commercial and civil space traffic. The transition will allow DOD to concentrate on its main objective, defending and securing the United States from threats here on Earth and in space. At Commerce, we're well suited for these new responsibilities. Most objects now going into space are in fact commercial. And as the friend of business agency, we act as a facilitator of business, not as a typical old-fashioned regulator. We already engage industry on a host of issues, stretching from export licensing to trade promotion to licensing of use in space. Commerce will immediately begin working with industry to determine what basic SSA and traffic coordination services are needed by private companies. And we'll use our preeminent SSA technologies and improve government services to incentivize more companies to launch under the US flag. These efforts and others to come from President Trump and the Space Council will make new activities in space possible, but only because of the ingenuity and innovative spirits of the people in this room. Non-traditional activities like space tourism, asteroid mining, space manufacturing, and lunar habitation will soon become a reality. Commerce is driving in today's space race, and the department looks forward to working with all of you as we expand upon the bounds of humanity and develop the last new business frontier, space. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Ross. Thank you for uh, all of your efforts, uh, so carefully enumerated, but how we make um, the American flag the flag of choice for space commerce. Well said. Uh, with that, uh, uh, Secretary Chow, the President's Space Policy Directive 2 assigned some ambitious goals for the Department of Transportation. Uh, 
Would you please give uh, the council an update on your ongoing work and let me thank you in advance for all of your efforts um, moving together uh, the president's agenda to really streamline and advance uh, the development of space on a commercial basis. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. As the president mentioned six years ago, the U.S. was third. Today, we are number one with 15 commercial launches in just the first six months of uh, 2018. The department is committed to building upon this momentum by streamlining and updating its launch and re-entry licensing criteria in accordance with the president's directive. That will give commercial space operators the approvals that they need more quickly and help to make the United States be an even more attractive place for commercial space enterprises. Here's an update on what we're doing. First, the department will release new proposed re uh, regulations for licensing commercial launch and re-entry activities by February 1, 2019. The new rules will enable a single license framework and replace many prescriptive and sometimes unnecessary regulations and requirements with performance-based criteria. We're working closely with the industry, our government partners, and the National Space Council as we develop these new regulations. Second, the department has created an aviation rulemaking committee consisting of industry, our government partners, and other important stakeholders. And as a result, this committee has provided a comprehensive set of recommendations to help us better understand what the new rules should look like. We have also met with our partners at the Air Force and NASA to discuss how the department can better enable commercial space launches without impacting adversely national security. And I'm happy to report that we're making good progress. Third, the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee has been revived and met last week. It will provide continuous insights that will help shape policy and enhance the department's approach. Fourth, as the department moves forward on this extremely important regulatory streamlining effort, we have remained very focused on continuing to make timely determinations for licenses. And fifth, the department is studying new technologies to help meet increased demand as commercial space launches move through our country's busy airspace managed by the FAA. As an example, the Space Data Integrator project has tremendous potential to help reduce the amount of airspace and time that must be blocked off for commercial launches. This will facilitate the safe and efficient integration of commercial space flights into our airspace while minimizing the impact on other airspace users. And finally, the department has chartered two additional aviation rulemaking committees. The first, addresses airspace access priorities, and it will provide a forum for commercial space and traditional aviation stakeholders to work with the FAA to minimize airspace conflicts and to propose criteria that may be used to ensure fair access given more demand. The other committee addresses spaceport categorization. Spaceports support different operations. New opportunities from aircraft-based launches are changing the definition of what it means to be a spaceport. So this committee will be a forum where the aviation and space communities can come together to discuss a spaceport characterization and categorization scheme. This will provide clearer information on safe operations to prospective spaceport enterprises, nearby aviation infrastructures, and the FAA. So taken together, all of these actions send a very clear message to companies around the world. If you want to license a commercial space operation, America is the place to do it. 
A recent study concluded that the commercial space industry will triple in seven years to $27 billion annually. If America wins a significant market share of this new industry, it could help drive economic growth, technical innovation, and job creation. So the department is committed to fully and safely integrating this growing sector into our national airspace system by streamlining licensing approvals, removing unnecessary regulatory burdens, leveraging new technologies, and working closely with stakeholders, all stakeholders. The department has a roadmap in place to help ensure that America remains number one in the commercial space sector. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Well, thank you, Secretary Chow. Thank you for uh, uh, your uh, tremendous efforts. And um, uh, uh, let, let, me also, um, let me also say that uh, I know the Department of Transportation uh, took uh, uh, very uh, strong steps uh, to reach that February 1st, 2019 uh, deadline regarding a commercial launch and reentry. And, uh, why don't you all join me in thanking uh, the secretary and her whole team on uh, hitting their marks. Thank you. Uh, on uh, new regulations and deregulations. Great job. Great job. Um, with that, uh, the uh, new NASA administrator has already been called out uh, and recognized warmly by this crowd. But let me add my congratulations uh, to Jim Bridenstine as the new administrator of NASA. We Thank are you, grateful sir. to have you on the team and in this council. I want to welcome you to your first meeting of the National Space Council. Um, and uh, grateful to have you sitting in the chair and at, at uh, uh, representing NASA in this conversation. Uh, last December, uh, the President signed uh, Space Policy Directive 1, which directs NASA to return American astronauts to the moon. We have discussed that at some length, uh, privately, and with your team, uh, to the moon first, and as the President said today, eventually to Mars. I know you've been diligently working with your team to develop a strategy to, to implement that Space Policy Directive, and I wanted to invite you to give the Council an update uh, on your work, but welcome. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, first of all, sir, it's an honor to serve my country in this capacity, uh, honor of a lifetime, and I'd like to thank you and the President for this opportunity. Um, I would also like to thank your Executive Secretary here on the Space Council, Scott Pace, um, who, when all the lights are off, I hear some... <laughs> when all the lights are off and the cameras aren't rolling, he works overtime to make sure this group is... Uh, is focused on a whole of, gov uh, a whole of government approach uh, under your direction. So thank you for that, sir, and thank you to the Executive Secretary, Scott Pace. I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention Jared Stout, who works side by side with Scott Pace on these issues. So we are underway executing the President's Space Policy Directive 1, which is our effort to return to the moon. And interestingly, we heard the President give his speech. He talked about it being sustainable. I wrote a few notes down of some things he said. He said that we've had a number of opportunities to go back to the moon since 1972. Um, he didn't mention them specifically, but the Space Exploration Initiative, the vision for space exploration, um, and each of these efforts got, in essence, undermined. The words he used were by bureaucracy and politics. And so our objective now, following the direction of the president, is to get back to the surface of the moon and back to orbit around the moon in a sustainable way. Uh, and, and he said, if I remember right, he said, we want more than just flags and footprints this time. He also said, rich guys love rockets. And I've heard him say that before. That's an important thing to recognize because the architecture that we're building now is entirely different than any architecture we've ever built before in an effort to get to the moon. And the reason is, we have more capabilities now than we've ever had as a nation, largely because of the efforts of many people in this room. The idea that we have 
reusable rockets to bring down the cost of launch and give us more access at a lesser cost than ever before, the miniaturization of electronics, these capabilities enable us to do more, in fact, with less, although thanks to you and the president, we're doing more with more, which is a, a good thing for the NASA budget, and we're grateful for that. So the, the opportunities before us are immense, and initially when we go back to, to the moon, um, there's a number of things that we need to do. We need low Earth orbit to be driven by commercial enterprise, and that's underway right now. Uh, under the president's budget request, uh, the, the International Space Station uh, will, will no longer receive direct support uh, in the year 2025. Um, in some ways, that's a big challenge for us at NASA, and we understand the challenge before us. But for the first time, we're having very serious conversations about how to make low Earth orbit commercialized. We, want, we, we don't want any gaps in human activity in low Earth orbit, and that means commercialization is the key. Then we can take our resources at NASA and go further, in other words, to the surface of the moon and then on to Mars. The first program that we have getting to, to the moon is called uh, CLIPS, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services. What we call it in, at NASA, what we talk about is taking shots on goal. Commercial Lunar Payload Services. These are not expensive missions and they're not carrying heavy payloads, but we're gonna give commercial companies an opportunity to land on the surface of the moon uh, and we would be a customer of that. They would have other customers as well, but we would be one of many customers in a very competitive market with as many as six or even more providers for our access to the surface of the moon. The reason this is important is because all of these capabilities in a competitive environment uh, result in, in, a, in effect, um, not just competition on price, but competition on innovation. So we can do more than we've probably ever done before. It's also important to note, Mr. Vice President, that when we go this direction, we are taking shots on goal. Not every shot gets made. <laughs> so it is very possible that some of our commercial providers, who we believe there are a number of them that are ready, but maybe some of them are not. So there is a, there is a risk that some of them won't be successful. But what we learn through this commercial lunar payload services program will be critical for the next step, which is heavier landers, not just capable of delivering instruments, but capable of delivering prospectors, things that can dig. We know from NASA's achievements back in 2008 and 2009, we know that there are potentially hundreds of billions of tons of water ice on the moon. Uh, from 1972 until then, in 2009, we didn't know that there was water ice on the surface. We now know that, so that represents an opportunity for us to learn more about the moon than we've ever learned before um, because we're gonna go to the surface and we're gonna prospect. That means we need heavier landers that can, that can carry things that, that can prospect the surface of the moon. And then beyond that, we need heavier landers that can take humans to the surface of the moon. So this is an iterative process where we're building capability uh, that we really haven't had, sir, since 1972. While we're doing this, we're also gonna put in orbit around the moon uh, what we call gateway. This is our opportunity to have more access to more parts of the moon than ever before. When you land on the surface of the moon, you're in one spot on the surface of the moon. But what we want is we want access to the entire moon. We also want to make sure that everything we develop is reusable. This ultimately gives us more access to our international partners, it puts us in a leadership position where the standards and interfaces are established by the United States of America, and then the landers that go from the gateway to the moon, the tugs that go from low Earth orbit to the gateway, it's all reusable. And it becomes a critical piece of infrastructure that we can then capitalize on with our commercial partners and our international partners. Again, the goal here, following the President's Space Policy Directive 1, the goal is sustainability. We do not want this to be Lucy and the football again. When we go to the moon, we're going, and as the president said in his speech, this time we're going to stay. Uh, and the, the gateway gives us that great opportunity. It's also important to note that as NASA develops these capabilities, each one of these capabilities feeds forward. The reason we go to the moon is because we want to land Americans on the surface of Mars. And the technologies, the capabilities, the in-situ resource utilization that we develop for the moon will ultimately get us 
to Mars. It's also why the gateway is so important. Having uh, an, an orbital outpost around the moon gives us more access to more parts of the solar system than ever before. And all those technologies are being developed uh, in and around the moon for the purpose of eventually getting humans to Mars. So, sir, I would say that Space Policy Directive 1 is well underway. We've got a long ways to go, but we're started, and certainly we want to get back to the moon as quickly as possible. Thank you. Great. Good job. Here we go. No notes. And you did all that without any notes. It's great to have you. Great to have you on board and in your position. With that, uh, he was just acknowledged a few moments ago, Dr. Scott Pace is the uh, uh, director of the National Space Council staff. Um, and uh, Dr. Pace, if you'd give uh, the team a, uh, an overview of uh, today's Space Policy Directive 3 and the implementation plan, we'll take action on that and then move very quickly uh, to our two upcoming panels. Dr. Pace. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, now that uh, Space Policy Directive 3 has been approved, uh, departments and agencies are working to transform that policy into action. Uh, the interagency working group has designated uh, leads and supporting departments and agencies for each of the goals uh, in the policy, outlining key tasks necessary uh, to achieve that goal, and they're establishing implementing actions uh, that involve the lead and supporting agencies tracking progress and reporting back to the Council uh, at regular intervals. Uh, the interagency working group planning has been coordinated and endorsed uh, at the deputies level, and, and I should add that uh, this has been a very uh, thorough and rigorous process that has involved uh, all of the departments and agencies, and we very much appreciated uh, the really deep thought uh, that people have given uh, to that effort. Uh, Mr. Vice President, it's important to emphasize that while there are roles and responsibilities outlined in Space Policy Directive 3 and designated lead departments, this doesn't mean that government organizations will perform all those actions uh, to achieve each goal or that they will somehow prevent U.S. industry uh, from contributing to space situational awareness and space traffic management. In fact, the policy and implementation plans are intended to establish an architecture, a framework that encourages commercial development and de of enhanced space safety data and services. We want to take advantage of the growing innovation in the private sector. It's going to be so necessary for this to succeed. Uh, there's a copy of the plan uh, in each of your binders, um, and the last page of the plan summarizes those implementation uh, actions and due dates. Uh, we are respectfully asking the Council to approve this plan for implementation of the President's policy, and with the Council's approval, uh, we will initiate tracking of the implementation actions and look forward to providing updates uh, at future Council meetings. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you, Dr. Pace. Are there any outstanding comments or objections to the implementation plan that's in your books? Um, seeing no objection, I direct the Executive Secretary to enter the implementation plan into the records of the National Space Council and to make publicly available a, a fact sheet on the policy and on the plan. I also direct the Executive Secretary to work with the members of the National Space Council to develop periodic updates on the implementation uh, of the plan. But uh, thank you very much, Dr. Thank you, Hayes. sir. I'm going to ask our first panel to go ahead and make their way uh, up to the table. Uh, for this first panel, we're going to be discussing science and exploration missions and the vital connection between the two. Uh, I want to commend uh, Administrator Bridenstine and his leadership team for the, the efforts that you just reflected on, strengthening the bonds of cooperation and collaboration between science and Human Exploration Directorates at NASA. You're, you're breaking down the barriers, and uh, it's exactly uh, what the President and I are hoping to see. Uh, we're grateful to be joined by three truly distinguished panelists who are going to speak in greater detail about the important ways in which our science missions complement our exploration missions and vice versa. Uh, I'll describe each of the panelists, and then I'll, I'll recognize you for uh, uh, maybe five minutes of remarks, and then we'll have some questions from members of the Council. Our first panelist is Dr. Louise Proctor, uh, Director of the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston, Texas. Our second panelist is Dr. Steve uh, Squires, the James A. Weeks Professor of Physical Sciences at Cornell University. And our third panelist is Mr. John Vellinger, President and CEO of TechShot, a space company based in Greenville, Indiana. 
With that, join me in welcoming this very distinguished panel for coming and sharing their perspective. Now, Dr. Louise Proctor is recognized, and thank you for being here. Mr. Vice President, members of the Council, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak today. Science and exploration enjoy a powerful synergistic relationship. Scientific research drives exploration, and exploration creates new opportunities for scientific discovery. This synergy is no more evident than at NASA, which, in its almost 60 years of existence, has been the embodiment of humankind's need to explore, to explain why we are here and why our Earth is so unique. Throughout those six decades, robotic exploration has proven to be a fundamental and essential component of NASA's space program, enabling incredible scientific discoveries about our solar system and universe. In the beginning, robotic spacecraft also served as pathfinders for the manned program, with the many ranger and surveyor missions characterizing the moon ahead of the astronauts who visited it. And since Apollo, robotic spacecraft have continued to feed the quest to explore and learn. They have traveled far beyond Earth's moon, examining asteroids, comets, and with the recent successful flyby of Pluto, every planet in the classical solar system, as well as many of their moons. Robotic missions are even now being developed to thoroughly examine ocean worlds, the few bodies in the solar system believed to harbor the ingredients of life and maybe even life itself. Robotic spacecraft act as scouts, going to hostile environments that no human can safely visit yet, and returning scientific knowledge that benefits our society in innumerable ways. Robotic exploration stimulates investments in technology development that are highly significant in achieving national and economic goals. Space exploration-related technology has resulted in advancements in a broad range of areas, including transportation, public safety, consumer goods, industrial productivity, and health. We must not underestimate the importance of education in this marriage of science and exploration. My own institute was created by President Lyndon Johnson 50 years ago for the specific purpose of bringing NASA and the university community together. It was realized that the expertise of scientific researchers was needed in order to analyze and interpret the treasure trove of information that was being returned from the moon around that time. In addition to carrying out cutting-edge research, universities play a key role as incubators for highly skilled scientists, engineers, mathematicians, technologists, and educators, who then move into our nation's workforce in many areas, not just space exploration. Hands-on science and technical training is just as important today as we plan the return of humans to the moon and beyond, as it was when we first met that challenge. The U.S. Civilian Space Program pushes our scientific and technological limits, making the seemingly impossible possible, and driving the creation of new partnerships with government, commercial, and academic organizations. NASA's accomplishments capture the attention of citizens and nations worldwide, emphasizing the U.S.'s global leadership in space and creating opportunities for peaceful and mutually beneficial international collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Proctor. Next, uh, I'd like to hear from uh, uh, Dr. Steve uh, Squires of uh, Cornell University. Dr. Squires, you're recognized. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Vice President, members of the Council, it's a real honor to be here today. For almost 60 years, the U.S. space program has been an inspiring example of American ingenuity. Throughout that time, exploration and science have gone hand in hand. Robotic precursor missions provide crucial data for designers of human missions and define the scientific goals for, for human explorers. I'm a robot guy. I've spent my career designing and operating robot explorers, but I firmly believe that the human explorers can achieve far more science than robots ever will. I also believe that the humans versus robots debate that we sometimes hear in space circles is based on a fundamentally false premise. Humans and robots are complementary in their strengths and their weaknesses, and a well-designed scientific space exploration will always use both. Now, our nation's civil space program is at a pivotal, pivotal moment now in its history. Space Policy Directive 1 clearly articulates the goal of sending humans back to the moon and onto Mars. This goal is clear, compelling, and achievable. A return to the moon is valuable before proceeding to more challenging targets. It's been more than 45 years since astronauts have ventured beyond low Earth orbit. 
The moon is an ideal place to validate the new technologies, vehicles, and operational procedures that will be needed to send astronauts beyond the Earth-Moon system. The moon also offers exciting scientific exploration potential in its own right, preserving in its rocks a record of the earliest events of the Earth-Moon system, as well as possessing resources that could enable ventures deeper into the solar system. Now, beyond the moon, exciting targets for exploration beckon. Foremost among these is Mars. 40 plus years of scientific, uh, scientific observations by Mars orbiters, landers, and rovers have revealed a world of enormous diversity and complexity. Most importantly, we have learned that Mars, alone among the planets, is enough like Earth that conditions at its surface might once have been capable of supporting life. So the goal for human exploration of Mars is therefore compelling and very easy to articulate. It is to send humans to the planet to learn if life ever took hold there. This is a goal worthy of a great national space program. So a guiding principle in designing our nation's lunar exploration should be that it also simultaneously lays the groundwork for the still more challenging goal of sending humans to Mars. Now, at the same time that humans and their robot helpers focus on the moon and Mars, more advanced robotic missions can press deeper into the solar system. Important targets include the ocean world to the outer solar system, especially Europa, a moon of Jupiter that appears to have a deep ocean of liquid water that might be capable of supporting life today. New technologies also now allow return of samples from a wide range of planetary bodies. These include Mars and comets, and this allows us to bring the full capability of Earth's best laboratories to bear on the solar system's most important scientific questions. Now, a compelling program of scientific space exploration of the moon, Mars, and beyond will be neither easy nor inexpensive. Uh, committed international partners surely can make an important contribution to an American-led program. But more importantly, commercial enterprises in the United States can partner with the government to spur innovation and reduce costs to the taxpayer while adding value to the program. The scientific exploration capabilities offered by potential commercial partners, to me, represents the most important and enabling space development in, in recent years. Thank you for the opportunity to address this council, and I look forward to the discussion to come. Uh, thank you, Dr. Squires, and uh, Mr. John Vellinger of uh, TechShot is recognized. Vice President Pence, distinguished members of the National Space Con Council, it's an honor to appear before you here today at the White House. I'd like to describe how TechShot, the company I co-founded in Indiana nearly 30 years ago, is an innovative engine that uses space to help, help make life better here on the Earth, while also enabling deep space exploration. One of our most exciting projects focuses on 3D bioprinting in space with the goal of manufacturing human tissues for patients here on Earth. Right now, we are building the TechShot biofabrication facility, which will launch to the International Space Station early next year. We will start with simpler tissues, such as patches that can help heal damaged hearts and steadily increase in complexity until we are biomanufacturing whole organs from space. The bioprinter may also play a critical role in deep space exploration, where it could be used to make food items or function as a compounding pharmacy, enabling the remote formulation of drugs optimized for each crew member. Besides our own use of the system, we will also allow others to use it. It will join our catalog of TechShot developed equipment currently on board the station, which we provide as a commercial service. For example, researchers from Eli Lilly, Novartis, UCLA, have used our bone densitometer x-ray machine in space to study new drug treatments for osteoporosis and muscle wasting diseases, both of which affect people here on the Earth and crews in deep space during long duration missions. Uh, astronaut Terry Vertz actually got to operate our bone densitometer on the International Space Station, so thank you, sir. I believe that NASA and its commercial space utilization program and the Centers for the Advancement of Sciences in Space are successfully increasing demand for low Earth orbit and commercial space services, and TechShot is providing many of the picks and shovels that researchers are using in this 21st century gold rush to space. 
beyond the commercialization of low Earth orbit, our contributions to exploration currently focus on other new technologies that enable mission success into deep space. TechShot is prototyping for NASA a machine we call the TechShot Fab Lab, which is capable of 3D manufacturing metals, ceramics, plastics, and more. It can even print complex electronic assemblies. If the agency likes our approach, the technology will be refined for testing aboard the International Space Station and eventually deployment aboard the Lunar Orbital Platform Gateway that the NASA Administrator just mentioned. TechShot's Fab Lab also will be used in austere environments here on Earth, such as onboard submarines that must remain submerged for months at a time. President Trump, Vice President Pence, under your leadership, the U.S. is entering an unprecedented golden age of space flight, which is presenting multiple opportunities to advance global American competitiveness. TechShot is proud to be playing a critical role in this unique time in space history. For this opportunity, I thank you. Good job. Well, thank you to all of our panelists. I will uh, uh, begin by uh, asking uh, one of our panelists to amplify, and then uh, I'll go to General uh, Dunford for a question, and then to our uh, uh, Deputy uh, Assistant um, Chief Technology Officer in the United States, Michael, and any other members of the panel. Um, let me start with Dr. Squires, if I may. You said you're a robot guy. Yes, um, sir. And uh, uh, we already knew that. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I'm, I'm really fascinated at, at uh, the way you, you described an appreciation. It's not in your mind. It seems that we have gotten away from human space exploration. The president's uh, vision and directive is to return America to a preeminent role of space exploration, the moon and the Mars, as you described. Um, how important uh, is it uh, for us in, in your mind, again, and uh, I know you addressed this, but I'd love for you to amplify the point that we, uh, that we uh, even while we continue to develop all these robotic technologies, that, that, that human space exploration be central to what, what we do on the moon and on Mars and beyond. It's tremendously important. If I may, let me tell you a very brief story. Uh, when we were first developing the Mars Exploration Rovers, we had a robotic precursor rover that we could take out into the Mojave Desert. And I was out there, and we were operating the rover, and the rover broke down. And so we had a little time on our hands. I had a bunch of very capable field geologists with me. And so I sent them off, and I said, go do some geologizing, OK? And I sat there with a stopwatch and a notebook. Didn't tell them what I was doing. And I watched as they would look around, walk over to a rock, pick it up, break it open, look at it with their hand lens. And I timed how long it took them to do that. What our magnificent state-of-the-art robots, like that one, the model of which is on the table in front of you, can do in a day, these people were doing in about 30 seconds. Okay, so humans offer far, far, far greater capability than, than robots, I believe, ever will. The other thing is that humans have a capability to inspire that is tremendously important. Okay, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, like everybody else on my team, watching Mercury, Gemini, Apollo on, t on TV and dreaming of sending spaceships to Mars someday. And now we do. And so I think that capability to use uniquely human talents to explore and to inspire other humans to, to follow their dreams is something that is just fundamentally important. That's great. And uh, our next panel will be three courageous astronauts. We'll hear more from about just that topic, but I, I thought I'd give a robot guy. <laughs> <laughs> chance to talk about how important uh, human exploration is. Uh, General Dunford. Hey, thanks, Mr. Vice President. My question is for Mr. Villinger. Um, Defense Department has partnered on bioprinting and biomanufacturing with obvious interest for uh, wounded warriors, and so your comments kind of caught my attention. What, what are the advantages of doing bioprinting and biomanufacturing in space, the implications for maybe the speed with which we can approach that? There's a lot of promise in, of course, academic institutions and so forth, but, but we haven't necessarily been able to deliver it at scale to date. Great question. Thank you, sir. Um, in space, we have a unique opportunity because of microgravity. Here on the ground, when we bioprint, we have to actually include a scaffold structure into the tissue that you're printing. 
In space, you don't have to do that because you don't have gravity. So you can use a lower viscous bioink material, which helps cells vascularize easier in space. So basically, you eliminate what helps, what actually re, um, causes more difficulty to do bioprinting on the ground. You eliminate that process when you go to microgravity, and you have the opportunity to create different structures that can vascularize and 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 help you know human beings here on Earth with with tissues and organs. No, thanks. Uh, Michael, go right ahead. Great. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Uh, just to build on that, Mr. Bellinger, just to follow up, I mean, we, we see a pretty, pretty incredible potential for pharmaceutical and medical breakthroughs uh, made possible through research in, in low Earth orbit. I guess the question for us on stage here is what, what can we as, as, as a government be doing better to, to encourage and, and foster more, more of that research and, and, and expedite the, the ultimate fruits of, of this incredible research? Thank you, sir. Um, I think Access to space is important. Um, the repeatability to be able to do these projects more often is very, very important. Um, being able to have the ability to interact with the crew, the astronauts, to be able to advance the technology and, and work with them real time is really important. And so I think I you know I would I would interaction with the with the crew, access to space, and just support of the technology. Any other members of the panel? Uh, Jim. Thank you, sir. I couldn't let Dr. Proctor go without a question. Um, so we know that uh, based on what NASA has already done, we, we understand that Mars used to have an ocean, mm -hmm. potentially as big as two-thirds of Mars was covered by water. We know that it used to have a magnetosphere, and we, knew, we know that it used to have a, a thick atmosphere, and we know that at some point, billions of years ago, all of that changed, and now, oh. It is, it is seemingly barren. We also know, um, although not definitely barren, hopefully we'll be able to find some biosignatures. We also know if, if you look at, at Venus, it's, it's experiencing runaway greenhouse effects. Can you share with us, as a NASA administrator, I hear a lot that every dollar we spend studying other planets is a dollar we don't spend studying our own planet, which I believe is critically important as well. Mm -hmm. Can you share how important it is or what we can learn by studying the moon, what can we learn about our own planet? What can we learn by studying Mars? What can we learn about our own planet? Yeah, and, and actually I would completely disagree with that statement that every dollar spent uh, exploring other planets is not a dollar spent uh, exploring the Earth. Everything we learn about the solar system tells us something about our Earth. Um, you can think of the solar system as a, a giant laboratory. If you want to know what happens if you change gravity, you can go to a different planet. If you want to know what happens if the um, climate uh, runs out of control, you can go to Venus. Um, so every time we explore another body, we learn something about the conditions that make our own planet so very special and so hospitable to life. Um, particularly with um, the other thing about planets, they don't have um, trees, they don't have buildings on them. You know, a lot of the surfaces are pristine or they have evolved in certain ways that are similar to our own planet. So um, essentially everything we learn throughout the solar system, also from small bodies um, and from other solar systems, now we're starting to look at exoplanets and understand again what, what makes the conditions just right for our Earth to be where it is in this very special place and time. So it's really a very cost-effective way of looking back in time at our own Earth and understanding how we got here. Thank you. Well, join me in thanking this Dr. Louise Proctor, Dr. Steve Squires, and Mr. John Villinger, thank you so much for your testimony today. Very helpful. Very well done. Well done. Next, I'd like to invite our next panel uh, to step forward. Um, we're honored to be joined today by uh, three American astronauts, and we'll now, having spoken about the interrelationship between scientific exploration and human exploration. Now we will talk about getting your perspective on how we accelerate human exploration of the solar system. Uh, before I do that, I thought it was noteworthy today, uh, June the 18th, to acknowledge that it was 35 years ago today, on June 18, 1983, that Sally Ride made history when she stepped onto the Space Shuttle Challenger and became the first American woman to venture into space. Sally Ride is an American hero 
His courage and pioneering spirit continue to inspire countless of young Americans across this country to pursue their dreams. Earlier this year, the U.S. Postal Service unveiled Sally Ride Forever as a stamp, and uh, uh, I know all of you join me uh, today in honoring her memory and celebrating her legacy at this meeting of the National Space Council. As I mentioned, we're, uh, we are joined by uh, three uh, ex exceptional Americans, uh, heroes all, uh, uh, members of the Astronaut Corps, and we are grateful, uh, grateful for your service to the country and grateful for you bringing your insights uh, with us today. Um, they're not the only astronauts here, uh, but they're the only ones that haven't been introduced much yet, so let me do that. Our first panelists are, are Colonel Eileen Collins, the first female pilot and commander of a space shuttle mission. Colonel Collins, it's an honor to have you here today. Thank you so much. Um, our second panelist is Colonel Terry Virts, a veteran of the shuttle program and a former commander of the International Space Station. Colonel Virts, thank you so much for your leadership and your insights today. And uh, Dr. Scott, Perezinski is a veteran of five flights on the space shuttle and uh, a, a deeply respected member of the astronaut corps. Thank you so much for your presence here today. <laughs> With that, we'll, uh, we'll ask each of, uh, of uh, the panelists to share for a few minutes and then we'll move on uh, to questions for this final uh, panel. And uh, Colonel Collins, you're recognized. Good afternoon. And uh, thank you, Mr. Vice President and members of the National Space Council. It's really an honor to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Scott and Terry and I are part of a group of about 500 people who have flown in space. We have had the unusual perspective of viewing the Earth from orbit. We've lived aboard the space shuttle and the space station. We've conducted rendezvous, spacewalks, science experiments, and robotics. We saw our planet from a different perspective, in an environment that forced us to think creatively about how things are done and what things can become. So I became interested in spaceflight at a young age when I first learned about the Gemini and Apollo astronauts. They inspired me to become an explorer and eventually to join the Air Force and become a pilot and a test pilot. As I look back over the decades of human spaceflight, the daring launches of Mercury, and the incredible bravery of the men that flew to the moon, I'm so proud of what the United States has accomplished. Some say that we could have done more, we could have been to Mars by now, but what is important now is that we have a strategy and we're looking forward. We stick to our plan, we don't quit, and of course we remember the lessons learned from the mistakes of the past. We must keep our missions as simple as possible. We must keep them, keep the costs as low as possible. Occasionally I have to remind myself of an old saying that I heard from the Apollo program, better is the enemy of good enough. So it doesn't all have to be the latest technology, but it does have to be safe, reliable, and mission focused. So I'll mention a few priorities for the future of human spaceflight. First, reestablishing our country's ability to launch astronauts from within the United States. It's been almost seven years now since we last saw an astronaut launch out of Florida. Now, for safety reasons, I certainly don't think this should ever be rushed. We're on a good track now. But I believe we need to keep an eye on the future and have a future strategy to avoid us getting back in this situation again. Second, I support the long-term goal of landing astronauts on Mars. For this to be successful, any critical equipment that's destined to Mars should be tested first on the surface of the moon. In my written statement, I reference a study from the National Academy of Science entitled Pathways to Exploration. Now in that report, they cite 10 critical technologies, and I'll mention the top three. Mars entry, descent, and landing, radiation safety, and power and propulsion. 
But another notable technology is the life support equipment, which includes systems that recycle air and water. Now, these are being tested right now on the space station, but the moon provides a more advanced test environment due to its similarity to Mars in gravity, in radiation environment, and in dust. And third, this is almost a no-brainer, but I support the uh, commercial partners and the uh, international partners. Uh, this is really essential for our space program. And by the way, I believe, I personally believe that space tourism someday will be hugely successful. And finally, just as I was inspired by the Apollo astronauts, a new generation of young people will want to study science and engineering in an effort to be part of this great journey. And they will also wonder, what is out there? What discoveries are waiting for us? And can I go? Over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Colonel Collins. Uh, great words. Uh, and uh, Colonel Terry Verts is recognized. Thank you for being here. Thank you, sir. Mr. Vice President and distinguished members of the National Space Council, Thank you for inviting me today, it's an honor. For several decades, America's human space program has focused on low Earth orbit. And for years, we have not had a clear long-term vision or goal for human space exploration. However, these are exciting times, and we now have the opportunity to clearly define such a vision. I believe that we should use the Apollo model as an example of how to proceed. However, Apollo was actually the sum of three distinct programs, as you know. Mercury, and then Gemini, and then finally Apollo. Project Mercury demonstrated that flying in space was possible. Gemini developed and tested the technologies that we would need to go to the moon eventually, and Apollo was, of course, the final mission. And that Apollo mission was very clear to land on the moon and return safely to Earth. The President's recent Space Policy Directive 1 calls for returning to the moon to establish a foundation to eventually enable missions to Mars a plan that I strongly agree with. <clears throat> Today, our top priority needs to be turning this high-level vision into very specific goals so that we could plan and execute an architecture that will achieve them. Using the Mercury, then Gemini, then Apollo paradigm, the ISS has already fulfilled the Mercury role, demonstrating that humans can live and work in space for extended periods of time. And now is the time to establish a program that will fill the role of Gemini developing and testing the technologies that we will need to return to the lunar surface and eventually fly to Mars. Unfortunately, the recently proposed Lunar Orbital Platform Gateway does not fill that role of Gemini. It essentially calls for building another orbital space station, a skill that my colleagues and I um, have already demonstrated on the ISS. Gateway will only slow us down, taking time and precious dollars away from the goal of returning to the lunar surface and eventually flying to Mars. I believe that we need to refocus our efforts to align with these long-term goals. The next steps that we take should leverage the international partnerships that we have built over the past two decades on ISS. And of course, they should also take advantage of our significant commercial capabilities that have demonstrated very recently a level of innovation and agility uh, that government simply does not possess. And most importantly, any future exploration plan must be bipartisan. Unless these efforts are truly bipartisan, from the beginning, they will be doomed to eventual cancellation. You see, getting back to the moon and eventually to Mars does not depend on rocket science. It depends on political science. Thank you, sir. I'll come back to that. <laughs> great, uh, great statement. Thank you so much, Colonel. Uh, and uh, Dr. Scott uh, Perezinski uh, is recognized. Thank you so much for being with us. Mr. Vice President and distinguished members of the council, thank you so much for the honor and opportunity to share my views with you here today. And it's also great to share the panel with my good friends, uh, Terry and Eileen. I grew up in the shadow of the Apollo program. Uh, my father actually worked uh, to help design and test the mighty Saturn V boosters that went to the moon in the late 60s, early 70s. And so I never grew out of that uh, boyhood dream of one day flying in space. And it, it turned out okay for me, I guess. Um, I feel so fortunate to have been born at a time and a place 
when such a lofty trajectory was possible. Um, as a kid, I wanted nothing more than to set the first boot prints on Mars, but I'm fiercely proud of the work that my NASA coworkers and I did. Uh, this helped set the stage for this inevitable journey. It's an incredibly exciting time to be engaged in the space business in what I call the barnstorming era of commercial human spaceflight, with so many pioneering American companies leading the innovations and investments. That said, the Space Age 2.0 Needs to, be, needs to overcome some enormous challenges if we aim to be more than just transient lunar and Martian guests. And we'll need to engage the public in very different ways to sustain their support. Building long duration planetary habitats and shielding them from the devastating uh, radiation exposure, not to mention the developing the technologies to extract water from the near absolute zero temperatures of the south pole of the moon, will challenge it, engineers to their limits. Living off of the land in self-sustaining colonies there will help us become even better stewards of planet Earth, something that deeply concerns young people today. Based on rigorous peer-reviewed science, they understand the impact humanity is having on their oceans, coral reefs, atmosphere, and rainforests, and they want to do something about it. They have a vested interest in the health and well-being of Earth and can really appreciate the value of pursuing planetary exploration as a means to understand the future of their home planet. Moreover, many in the general public, and especially young people, are as excited about space as I was as a kid. But the possibilities are even wider. It's still incredibly cool to work at NASA, of course, uh, but uh, they can also now work at SpaceX and, and at Blue Origin, Boeing, Virgin Galactic, and, and many other wonderful companies. In the near term, I believe there will be tremendous opportunities to engage and inspire the public with the establishment of a significant lunar outpost akin to the South Pole Station in Antarctica. Owing to political reality since Apollo, however, I'm frustrated with our national failure to commit to a sustained, bold exploration beyond Earth orbit. Sadly, we could probably stack up all the NASA studies that have been done over the years uh, on NASA's next step in, steps into space and attain lunar orbit. I believe that uh, the way you climb an enormous mountain, like Mount Everest, which is uh, something that I also know a thing or two about, is to take the long view Prepare, for your, prepare to your utmost, and then take it one rope length at a time, sometimes even one breathless step at a time, understanding that it'll be harder than you ever imagined. It'll likely take longer and cost more, too. I propose a true decadal approach to ambitious human spaceflight goals, similar to that taken by NASA's space science community. I suggest to you that this human spaceflight decadal plan needs to be free of appropriations earmarks to particular space centers or companies, but rather latched to the long-term goal of achieving lunar and then Martian presence. Set the goals, then let NASA choose and fund the very best solutions, irrespective of which congressional district the work is conducted in. Measure and reward successes, acknowledge and cut failures, but then keep moving forward towards the, the prize. So in closing, uh, I just suggest to you that one of the greatest accomplishments of the International Space Station program has been bringing together nations for the common good of humanity pooling resources in the best minds, and bringing the world closer together. I'm convinced that the first Martians have already been born, uh, and they're already preparing for humanity's next giant leap. It's my greatest wish that this journey will be led by Americans, but I also hope that we'll take those first steps in peace and partnership with colleagues from around the world. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, Scott. Uh, very inspiring words. Uh, did you say one rope length at a time? Is that uh, uh, very sage? And um, um, it, it strikes me that each of the each of the panelists talked about um, the importance of a of not only a plan, but the ability to sustain that plan uh, over a long period of time. And um, uh, and uh, Terry, I, I, I was struck by your words, but the wisdom of your words that said this is as much about uh, political science as it is about rocket science uh, in terms of getting America, as the president has announced, back to the moon and then on, on to Mars. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, Eileen, you mentioned those three questions. I remembered the last one. So what is out there? What were the three questions again? What is out there? What discoveries are left for us to make? And can I go? Yeah. 
I know the answer to the third one for me. So, um, I, I guess I'd, I'd throw the question out to the to the panel as a whole, um, and, and that is, uh, uh, other than your inspiring example in your words today, uh, which will make their way across the country from this forum, um, how how would you how would you advise the National Space Council to continue to build uh, the momentum behind a renewed commitment? Uh, to uh, uh, America leading uh, in, uh, in space exploration and, and particularly in human exploration of the moon and Mars and beyond. Eileen? Well, thank you, sir, for the question. I think uh, we, we can all uh, chime in on that. But um, I would think initially we have got to get the support of the American people by getting the message out to people. And we all speak at schools and colleges and rotary clubs. People love the space mission, and it's something that brings us together. And not only do students show up, but parents, teachers, people come. If we on the National Space Council can get, somehow use the media, I say the mass media because we want to get our message out, we all hear our message. You know, here in this room and within the space industry, we all hear ourselves, but we don't want to be just echoing our own remarks. We want to get that out. So one of the things I think we can do is work very hard on connecting with mass media. Yes, sir. I think the, um, I agree with Eileen, but I think we really need, and it's probably your job to set specific goals of exactly what we're going to do um, so that we know what we're doing. And then if we can make that bipartisan, like I said, otherwise it'll be on that stack of uh, what NASA has happened in the past few decades. And another really important thing, if you remember in the early 90s, uh, the space station passed Congress by one vote. And the reason it did was because it was an international program. And that was kind of, we weren't allowed to cancel it because we had commitments. And I think making that international commitment, just by the nature of our democracy, um, it's very easy for things to change. And having an international partnership adds a level of stability that doesn't make it nice or it doesn't make it less expensive. It actually makes it either possible or not. I think if we don't have international partners, um, just looking into the future, I can foresee things being very much easier to cancel than they would be given a strong uh, partnership. And using what our international partners can contribute can actually make the project less expensive and you know more successful. I think uh, taking the long view, having a, a, a long-term established goal and, and inexorably working towards it uh, is something that needs to be com communicated well. And, uh, and I think young people will understand that there is a place for them. Uh, and I would, I would just uh, differ slightly to say that I think space exploration is nonpartisan. I think it's something that's in the American spirit, in the human spirit, to explore. And, um, and if you go to any school, any community, um, there's a strong support for continuing to press the boundaries in, in exploration because it benefits all of our walks of life. Well, I, I thank you for that. I'm going to I'm going to recognize um, uh, Secretary Chow for a question. But I, I uh, would all of you agree the importance of having our own platforms to be able to reach space. Uh, we see the excitement being generated out of the commercial space industry, but very soon, the United States uh, will have the ability to put courageous astronauts uh, like you back in space on our own platforms. Is that, do you see that as, uh, as an important part of generating the connection between the popular support across the country and, and the reality of support that, that uh, translates into, sustain, into a sustainable um, a commitment uh, to uh, leadership in space? I think we all agree very strongly with that statement, yeah. American leadership, and the world looks to us, and you know, Europe and other countries look to America for that leadership, and I think we need to lead for sure. It's a big part of what America is. Right. Good. Okay. Secretary Chow. Gosh darn it, the Vice President asked my question. <laughs> but I have another one. And that is the former Secretary of Labor, I'm always very concerned about workforce development. So Dr. Perezinski, there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, the, the future of STEM studies yes. in our nation. How are we on the right path? Do you think we're doing better? Or do you see the need for any course corrections and how to get more young people excited? 
When I talk to young people, I, I tell them that it's important to learn uh, a couple of foreign languages and not the traditional languages that you might expect. I tell them that the two most important languages that they need to learn are math and science. To be competitive in the future industries uh, in robotics, uh, as uh, Steve is engaged in, but uh, um, in so many different aspects of our, our future society and uh, in technological growth. And so uh, that's the message that I, I would put forward. Could I add something yes, to course. that? I think Colonel maybe Collins. The, um, the federal government does help students uh, go out and get a college education with whatever degree they would like. But if we could incentivize them financially in some of the programs to go towards math and science, technology, engineering, I think that would help. Uh, Mr. Vice President, before I hand it over, I want to thank all these three for their um, service to our country. How exciting. Thank you. Secretary Ross. Thank you. I'd like to ask each of the panelists, how could we better facilitate commercial participation in the activities you're describing? Each of you talked about the need for partnerships and collaboration. Are there one or two specific things that government could do better to encourage commercial cooperation? I can, I can start. Uh, one of the things that I've um, uh, known from my prior life in, in industry is just the difficulties through the federal acquisition process. It's a very long pathway, and if there are ways to streamline that to make it more entrepreneurial, quick turnaround, um, as I think one of the prior panelists said, it's important to have access to space to be able to fail, to get back up and go again. And so we need to have uh, frequent access to space. And I think one of the ways to, to make that possible is to figure out ways to uh, shorten the, uh, the acquisition process. Yes, sir, I'll just add, I've got very good friends and former crewmates that work at Blue Origin and SpaceX and Boeing and other companies. Um, and the speed that they can do innovation is really amazing. And I think if the government can come up with ways to um, contract with them with very minimal requirements. Look, there's this thing called requirements creep, and that is the killer of all. Right, the Wright brothers probably had to suffer through requirements creep 100 years ago. Um, if we can figure out a way to get those contracts made and let them innovate, tell them what we want, and then let the companies do the work, I think we can get things done. And I know we're trying. I know we've, we're in the process right now of doing that. So I think we need to continue that process, and 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 we'll get to the moon and Mars a lot quicker if we do that. Yes, sir. The NASA administrator had mentioned earlier about the incentives right now that NASA is giving small companies to go to the lunar surface and, you know, starting small, uh, small landers and then building up from there to larger landers and maybe eventually the human uh, lander on the moon. So I, NASA's doing this now. It's small, but I think if it's successful, we should expand on that and give more incentives, just turn them loose. Don't tell them you have to do it exactly this way per the requirements, but tell them this is the end goal, figure out how to get there, here's your financial incentive to get you started. I think that those programs will be successful and I will keep an eye on it, but I think we can, we'll eventually be doing more of those. Well, that's great, I think it's really impressive that you can not only be astronauts, but have very thoughtful views on how commercial sector can help, thank you. Very good. Let me recognize our NASA administrator for the last question for the panel, and then we'll move toward uh, wrapping up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice President. In the previous panel, I talked about how some people say that every dollar we spend studying other planets is a dollar we're not spending studying our own planet. Uh, similarly, I, I hear frequently that every dollar we spend studying the moon or going to the moon or developing the technologies and capabilities for the moon, uh, those are dollars that we're not spending going to Mars. Um, and and Colonel Collins, I heard you very clearly say, you mentioned uh, the Pathways Report, which of course came out when I was still serving in the Congress, and of course it was chaired by another famous Indianan, Mitch Daniels. Um, and I was wondering if you could share with us, how do you see our effort getting to the moon enabling, ultimately, our path to get to Mars? Well, as a former test pilot, I believe in the build-up approach. So to get somewhere as safe as possible 
you want to write a test plan and you want to have a build-up approach. So to control what you're doing, you test it and then you add a variable, you test it, you add another variable, you test it. So I think by, by you know, it, it's, we, we can use the moon as a stepping stone. Um, right now we're testing on the space station, which is critical, but the space station doesn't have dust, for example. So how do we know that this life support equipment isn't just going to fail because there's too much dust and the valves are in the equipment, maybe the radiation environment? So the moon is a stepping stone. To me, it's just critical. If I'm going to go to the moon and live there, I would like to know that this equipment that's keeping me alive has worked on the moon. So that's the reason I said that. The, the Pathways report specifically referenced the moon as the quickest way to get to Mars. Is that correct? If I remember right, either way. Well, I think you're saying that. I think, yes, that's true. Yeah. Um, I do believe that, although um, I would say, I was thinking of there's the 10 critical technologies, and I believe the vast majority of those can be tested on the moon. And I'm trying to remember what they are all right now. Like, for example, one of them is uh, the suits that the astronauts will be using on the surface. Got to be tested on the surface of Mars. Um, the uh, uh, habitats are another one tested on the surface of the moon before Mars. So that's in the, uh, as far as whether or not it's the fastest way, that I would say would be up to debate okay. and would need to be studied a little bit more. But I would take it uh, from the experts that it would be probably the safest way. Got I it. definitely believe it would be the safest way. Got it. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. No, uh, thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. And uh, join me in thanking this outstanding panel for their remarks and also their service to the country. Great job. Uh, I, w I also wanted to mention that these are not the only astronauts in the room. This is a, an extraordinary group of Americans, but we're also joined uh, today uh, by uh, three astronauts that I wanted to recognize. One is a member of the Council's advisory group, which will be meeting for the first time tomorrow. He's flown in space four times, walked in space seven times, and uh, he happens to be from Indiana. Uh, astronaut David Wolf is with us. Uh, David, we're honored. To stand up. Thank you. Also, the president mentioned these two, but they didn't get to stand up. Um, Jack Schmidt was the first geologist on the moon in Apollo 17, a former senator from New Mexico. And Jack, I want to promise you that we're going to put more geologists and scientists on the moon. Jack, uh, please stand up and let us thank you. For your service. Thank you, sir. And lastly, one of the one of the heroes of my youth, although he may not like me saying that, uh, he was a, a Gemini astronaut, second man on the moon, Apollo 11, and is one of the greatest voices for getting America back to the moon and on to Mars. The incomparable Dr. Buzz Aldrin is with us today. Uh, let me, uh, before I close, I want to recognize two members of the cabinet who are with us today for a few brief remarks on uh, uh, what they gleaned uh, uh, from uh, this presentation and their focus. Uh, Dan Coates is the Director of National Intelligence for the United States, and Mr. Director, you're recognized. Well, Mr. Vice President, thank you for the opportunity to, first of all, the honor to be part of the Space Council. Uh, this is quite an extraordinary experience uh, today uh, with an awful lot of promise ahead, and I thank you for that opportunity to be part of it. Um, I've been around long enough to uh, go all the way back, the launch of Sputnik, the first piece of now debris in, uh, in space, joining tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pieces of debris. That's, a, that's one of the questions that uh, we have to deal with because as an intelligence agency, we do develop, uh, uh, build, launch uh, satellites and uh, instruments uh, into space. We collect from a realm of ground, sea, air, up to a certain altitude, 
and now the realm of space, and it's incredibly important uh, for us because we provide information from those collections that provide security and safety to the American people. And so it's a very essential piece. Uh, we joined with General Dunford, with the military, in terms of providing war fighters the need, the intelligence they need that can be garnered uh, from assets in space, as well as uh, our citizens and our country in terms of what we uh, do up there. Um, I could give you some exciting examples, but it's classified, so I can't do it. <laughs> But just trust me, um, it is something that's absolutely essential. And to be part of this uh, effort uh, and joining from, right. and with a perspective from the intelligence uh, community is a, is a true, uh, true privilege. Um, I think most of us in this room reach back to that day uh, with the launch toward the moon, uh, the message that came back. Um, uh, that was one of the most exciting times of, of my lifetime. And I think we're now on the cusp of moving into a new era where young people will be growing up looking at some phenomenal things happening in space. And uh, this is a great way to kick it off. Thank you, Mr. President, Vice President. Thank you, Dan. Great job. Great work. The uh, director of the Office of Management and Budget, Mick Mulvaney. I, I just wonder how often Coates has used that line about wanting to tell us something but not being able to because it's classified. <laughs> so, um, Mr. Vice President, thank you for doing this. Um, I always, when we do these, uh, the, the takeaways for me, the, the, the aspirational concepts here, the aspirational rhetoric is absolutely critical. There's no question about it. There is no, nothing, there is nothing more aspirational than what we've talked about here today. At the same point, it's very practical. Uh, analysis that we're doing so that the practical takeaways are what the value is to me. So to have folks who actually are in the industry and come in and challenge us on specifics. Um, I think it was uh, Colonel Wirtz who said, well, like, maybe the gateway um, is not something that helps us get to Mars faster. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but there's a practical takeaway from that that helps spur this debate, which we have to have. Um, I also heard Colonel Collins talk about keeping missions simpler and trying to find technologies that are more readily available. Um, those are the practical kind of takeaways that I think are helpful to me. I also like it when people say there's ways to do it cheaper. Um, Y'all didn't see, say that nearly enough, but that's okay. We can get to that part later. So thank you for doing it because I do think that at the end of the day, this is more than just a group of people getting together and talking about something that they all have a, a common interest in. This is actually something that moves the ball in the right direction. I appreciate you doing it. Great. Well, seeing uh, no other uh, uh, no other members of the uh, National Space Council seeking uh, recognition, let me thank you all for your time uh, and and your efforts. Uh, these are extraordinarily busy people, and uh, we we also want to uh, not only thank the cabinet members who are here, but the deputy secretaries and the undersecretaries uh, who uh, join us as well. A uh, little bit of housekeeping. For National Space Council members, if you have an outstanding assignment, please work with our Executive Secretary to complete them. Uh, Dr. Pace and his staff are going to ensure that you have what you need uh, to follow up on uh, uh, Space Policy Directive uh, 3, and we'll be working energetically before the next Space Council meeting to move forward. Uh, with that mentioned, let me, uh, let me invite the room to thank Dr., uh, Dr. Pace and Jared Stout for their work putting to together uh, and uh, for all the work they do with the National Space Council. You can see a rather memorable picture of myself and the President and the staff of the National Space Council uh, in the Oval Office when they have stopped in to tell the President about the plans for this upcoming meeting and uh, our plans to have it here at the White House, and uh, he promptly ushered them behind uh, the Resolute desk and uh, took a photograph and then sat them down for the better part of an hour to talk about the space program, and his enthusiasm was evidence again today. Um, uh, second to last, let me thank uh, members of the National Space Council's User Advisory Group who are here with us today. The President recognized many of you, but uh, the men and women who are gathered here uh, coming out of uh, private enterprise and public life really represent uh, the bulwark of some of the, the greatest and most innovative minds and organizations in and around the space enterprise in the United States. And I know that tomorrow the user advisory group will meet 
uh, for the first time, and I just want to assure you that um, uh, all the members of the National Space Council uh, uh, see your input and your counsel as vital uh, as we uh, revive uh, American leadership in space uh, and ensure that the, the President's vision for the moon, Mars, and beyond uh, becomes a reality. So uh, if everyone would join me in thanking the user advisory group members who are here with us today. <laughs> Lastly, allow me just to thank uh, the president for his uh, hospitality. Um, uh, I think by, uh, uh, by hosting us here at the White House, the president uh, 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 sent a clear message about the priority uh, of American leadership in space uh, to uh, not only all those gathered here, but those looking on and people across the country and, and the wider world. I want to thank all of you for being a part of this, thank our panelists again, but uh, truly grateful for the President's uh, leadership, uh, for his vision, for his energy. I think thanks to uh, the efforts of all of you uh, and thanks to the leadership of President Donald Trump, America is leading in space once again. So thank you all very much. We'll go right back to work, and we'll see you at the next meeting of the National Space Council.